All movement is generated from chi through the center of the body so that arms and legs never move independently. The whole body is connected. Kind of a background instrument for the West African <laughs> drum orchestras that they have over there. What defines a universal woman? She's one who excels in many fields, artistic, social, and intellectual. Laura Rich She's a painter, a singer, a musician, an educator, a martial artist. Laura's inspiring story is one of transforming tragedy into triumph. Today on Tea with Treasure. This is Laura Rich and she is the executive director of the Rogue Valley Chorale Association. A group of um, five choruses ranging in age from eight years old all the way through um, 80 plus. Right. Yeah. So about how many people would you say are involved? About 300. Wow. 300 singers from all ages. For me, the concert is a wonderful thing and I love knowing that we're about to uh, give this gift of music to our audience members. memories are of music. Um, my mother says I, I sang before I spoke. As a dancer per se, I, I love to move, however, and I love to move to music. And I really, I was excited to learn that you had taken a, a job to go tour with a dance company from LA, is that right? Yeah. I've always been very fascinated with world dance, ethnic dance, dance from, you know, the indigenous people in a culture and how they express themselves through movement. And um, somewhere along the way, I discovered the music and the dancing and singing of Africa. And um, so I spent about 10 years uh, traveling there and studying the music and the dancing. How and why? What called you to go to Guinea? Um, so a friend of mine dragged me to a women's drum retreat. <laughs> Thank God for our friends, right? <laughs> well, I thought, oh gosh, we're all going to be howling at the moon. I loved it. Right. And the um, person that was teaching was from Africa. And he saw that I had some semblance of musical ability. Uh, he invited me to come to Africa. Stayed with his family, got to know his family, and took classes in drumming and dancing all day long. Right. I loved it. Oh my goodness. There were things that were really hard over there. Mm -hmm. um, it was extremely hard to see the poverty. and. I didn't realize how much it had impacted me to be there, to just look at these people, people that had so little, had so much it, music and culture and, and friends and 
family, and that's what became important. My mother was um, very influential in my life. She was a teacher. She loved teaching special ed. Um, and I used to tag along and go with her. I pursued teaching, got licensed to teach Montessori. At a school, I ran a school. It was just a really neat school. My father was very high-functioning autism. Uh, autistic, he, the savant kind. He, he couldn't read social cues, and so he was constantly getting scammed. Mm. I loved my father, and even though he had trouble expressing himself emotionally, I always seemed to know that. He was proud of me, that um, he was limited in his ability to express, but not in what he felt. It's lovely. Yeah, I loved my dad. He just passed away a few years ago. My sister is, has, is on the autism spectrum too, as am I. I don't think I got the social stuff, but I got the brainy math weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and thought processes, uh, synesthesia. Talk about synesthesia. Musically. When I hear certain pitches, I'll see a certain color. So if I'm listening to uh, Beethoven's first symphony and it's in the key of C, it's going to present as yellow to me. I'll see <clears throat> um, like a, a vapor of yellow in front of me. It's, I hear a song and I'll see yellow, I'll know that it's in the key of C. I was um, in Canada and I was with a girlfriend, and we decided that we would catch a ride back into the United States with a, a, a truck driver. I did not choose the right truck driver. I was basically kidnapped and uh, sexually assaulted, and the, the man who did this to me used a knife, left me in a ditch to die. Somewhere inside of me, I had a drive and crawled out of that ditch and got help and um, started this slow journey toward recovery. Right. It was really hard because I didn't know how to recover. The wounds that I had um, experienced went beyond the physical. I hate what that guy did to me. And I realized that someone who did that to me had to have been in such a dark, horrible place themselves. In college, I studied sociology and did a lot of work on survivors of sexual assault. I also interviewed sex offenders. They were, by and large, nice guys who had horrible upbringings. Once I could forgive, it was like this weight off my shoulders. Uh, does forgiving mean accepting that someone can do these things? No. But it means that for me, I had to let it go. 
that whole experience helped me really define my own sense of what was important. Mm -hmm. Philip was part of the reason I finally worked through it. I didn't want to blow my relationship with Philip. I knew this was something really special. And so I sought therapy again, which I had done numerous times. This time I was determined. And um, saw how the experience had impacted me. Years after the attack, Laura was in graduate studies at the University of South Carolina. She began teaching guitar and martial arts at a local studio and there met Philip. Here she describes our first meeting. We had a staff meeting and in walked this incredibly handsome man. Right. I, and it was like someone hit me in the head and said, you're going to marry him. Uh, uh. I had hair to my ankles and the first time he saw me, I had a black belt on and a guitar in my hand. So. Did you ever tell him in the interim that you had that? Oh, yes. That hit? Oh, yeah. I did. Uh -huh. And what, what was his response? He said, hmm, I didn't have the same feeling. <laughs> A lot of midwives um, have an experience where they feel called. Mm -hmm. It became something I needed to do because I couldn't have children. It was a way for me to experience labor and delivery um, sort of vicariously. Right. Laura struggled with stick figures and I had just never seen her produce anything um, that was artistic, and so when she said she was going to take this up, I it blew me away that simply learning technique allowed her to come up with this kind of um, beauty and uh, really to express it so well. It's impossible to say to Laura, you can't do this. In fact, <laughs> if you that. say that, yeah. she takes that as a challenge. Right. That artistic part of her that is so focused on detail. Laura's acute focus on detail is on vivid display in other projects she has undertaken. Here's the rock wall creation on the outside of her art studio. I love the crystals. Fun to put it all together. Yes! That's, that's part of that artistic thing, whether you have hyper-focus detail oh. and sticking to it. It took a while. You have to sort of do it by layer, layer by layer. This rock has to rest on this rock. And I couldn't put this one here until this one was hardened and in place. Okay. What pretty colors. Some of them have meaning. Sure. Um, but this was something we dragged back from South Carolina. And here's spirals in a, a tile mosaic that she's created on the floor here. Spirals are everywhere. Her wall of watercolors, such a wide array of creative expression. Those are, those are molded on my legs. <laughs> <laughs> and then you did all the rock work for the wall, yeah. Uh -huh. And then planted this succulent garden. Yeah. We conclude our visit with a trip around the expansive backyard garden Philip and Laura maintain with the help of their caretaker cat, Blanco. Here's Philip recounting Blanco's arrival. Blanco showed up in the yard, the back part of the yard, one day limping and bloody, he looked like he'd been in a fight. And I knew as wounded as he was that he would die. I had to intervene. I had to do what I could do. And I just started putting food out for him. And, uh, so we began to work together and we've been a team ever since. The garden where we grow all of our food is Blanco's hunting ground. So he's a big help in keeping down those animals that would otherwise be eating vegetables in the garden. I grew up with uh, an fruit farm. It was an old fruit farm, and we always had a garden, and when we moved here, everything was dead. So we got to 
create it like we wanted it to be. We added a lot of paths. I like the flow. I like curves. I like spirals. You always wonder what's around the bend. Around the next bend, we'll find another of Laura's unique creations, full of curves and spirals and scales. They, they um, knocked out the back of the house when we were renovating and threw all the rubble here. So we piled it up. Not so much we. I, I took I, pictures <laughs> of Laura doing it. <laughs> These walls are filled with the rocks and bricks and debris. And we covered it with cement. Those are spoons that make the scales. <laughs> That's and, great. Uh, and he's got a funny face. You can kind of see his jaw hangs. You can see his face. Because we had a bucket <gasps> under there, and the weight of the cement crushed the bucket. So the cement all sort of dropped to one side. Um, <laughs> he's kind of got a Mona Lisa smile. Absolutely. <laughs> As we enter the final stretch of the garden path, Laura points out the barren trees that will soon bear fruit. Earlier, Philip invited me back in the spring to see the spectacular colors of new growth. Yeah. Yeah. Such a strong and clear message about the cycles that we are we're part of mm -hmm. here. Decline, decay, renewal. It's good to get to the point when you are embracing the decay and then the eventual transition rather than resisting it. I think in resistance to anything is where the pain is. If you were going to encapsulate the message of your life, what would you say? Remain open. Remain open to what falls in front of you and embrace it. <laughs>